I always have this awkward moment after I get a haircut where it, like it's competitive. I might actually have more hair on my face than I do on my head. What's happening, everybody? Justin, Bridgewater Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled as always by the incredible folks at Nerd Tees, and welcome to week four of my weekly CFL football pick show for the 2023 CFL season, and for the second time in three weeks, look, we were well underwater with the picks in week three, and that's kind of why the, uh, the thumbnail for this video is just me pointing basically at you. Not that I'm blaming you for the fact that I had a bad week. That's not it. But, like, I'm starting to catch some some flack, really basically just from hashtag one guy. When I hit the record button at the beginning of week one, that's me signing up for the grind. It, it, nobody's going to have the right answers all the time. There's going to be bad weeks. And when I hit that record button, I'm signing up for the grind that comes along with this. There are very few, if anybody else that does what I do, which is picking every game, every week, from all three angles, straight up, against the spread, and over under. Very few people will take that on. I do the same thing for the NFL. It is a grind all season long, and there's gonna be bad weeks. Never get too high, never get too low. Am I worried about having two bad weeks at the beginning of the season? Not at all. Now, in saying that, we always want to improve. We always want to get better. And we're going to start manifesting our destiny here a little bit and asking the universe for what we want. If we don't ask, we'll never get it. So this is me asking the universe, manifesting for myself, let's say six and three this week. That's reasonable. It's not, well, why don't you ask for nine and oh? Like, let's, let's start with something realistic. Let's build some momentum here. I'm asking the universe for six and three this week. Now, look, week three, it was bad. I was three and nine for the second time this season. I was three and nine. Only one and three straight up, which means I'm even money six and six. It was two and two against the spread, which could have been worse. I'm an even money six and six. And on the totals, I missed all of them. I was 0 and four on the totals. Three and nine on the totals this year. So I'm 15 and 21 to start the season, but all of that has been given away on the totals. I'm even money straight up and even money against the spread. I've given it all away on the totals, which I guess if you knew that was going to happen, you'd predict it was on the totals because that's just the kind of prognosticator that I am. So look, the sky is not falling for having two bad weeks at the beginning of the year. Got that off my chest. We move forward. Where I did have a great week is CFL Fantasy. I had an awesome week in CFL Fantasy this week. In week three, 124.9 points. And what does that mean? There's thousands and thousands and thousands of people that play CFL Fantasy every single week. Of those, I ranked 164th. Top 170 in week three with that excellent performance of 124.9 points. And in Derek Taylor's league, which I've joined, I believe it's still the largest CFL fantasy league in the whole game, I was 12th in week three. I had a massive performance in week three in fantasy, which felt great. Now up to 312.4 on the season. I am top 500 across the whole game, which is where I want to be at the end of the season. As you know, it's easier to get to the top of the mountain than stay at the top of the mountain. This is where I want to be all season long. Let's see if we can't maintain it. Number 469 overall in the game and in Derek Taylor's league, I've now moved into the top 60. I'm 59th in that league, three through three weeks of CFL Fantasy, which is awesome. Shout out to my most outstanding player from week three. It's Toronto Argos running back AJ Willette. And like, I had some options this week. I had AJ Willette who had a massive week. I had Austin Mack who had a massive week. My quarterback, Chad Kelly, put up a 20 plus point performance, but that was of course only because he was my captain. I got to give it to AJ Willette. 18 carries, 84 yards, and not one, not two, but a hat trick of rushing touchdowns for A.J. Ouellette, good for 26.4 points. Everyone in my lineup, every single roster spot on my lineup, including the defense, all hit double digits. I had multiple that were above 25 points, multiple that were above 20. It was a great CFL fantasy week, but A.J. Ouellette stood above everyone. Now, I will not be giving you my fantasy roster in this video once again because, like, 
Genius Sports, CFL Fantasy people, my guys, you've got to help me out. You gotta help me out here. I record this show usually on Tuesdays. Once the NFL starts, it'll move to Wednesdays and this won't be a problem. But until that happens, you gotta open up the next week's rosters earlier. You gotta open them up on like the, the weeks are done on Sunday. The week starts off with the Edmonton Elks traveling to Ottawa to take on the Red Blacks, a battle of two brand new starting quarterbacks. We got the Winnipeg Blue Bombers fresh off of a loss, which you don't talk about very often. They travel to Montreal. They got to be angry. They're going to be taking on the Alouettes. And then the week ends with what I believe is the marquee game of the week. It's the BC Lions back-to-back -back road games for BC. They travel to Toronto to take on the Argos in what a lot of people are talking about as a great cup preview. League-wide so far this season, road teams have been coming to play. They are 8-4, and four, both straight up and against the spread so far in 2023 in the CFL. Road favorites, in fact, 3-1 and one against the spread so far this season. So obviously, three of the six hits overall for favorites against the spread have come from teams on the road. We've also hit four consecutive overs in the CFL, dating back to the finale of Week 2. So it started as unders but hashtag over season may in fact be here so let's start with that first game the Edmonton Elks traveling to Ottawa to take on the Red Blacks and the Elks they once again briefly appear competitive in their game last week it was a one point game at halftime Edmonton was hanging right there until you know a five minute segment in the third quarter spurned on by a terrible penalty a penalty that no professional football player should take. Like an awful horse collar. The play is it's not over, but like, you know you can't do that. <laughs> so like, I don't know, it, it was mind-boggling. But that penalty and that 15 yards facilitates a five-minute period where the Argos put 15 points on the board against the Elks. The game is essentially over at that point. And the Elks make what I consider to be an unwarranted quarterback change. Look, if I'm the last Taylor Cornelius apologist on the internet, so be it. But benching a quarterback who, to that point in the game, was 14 for 18 with a touchdown, as if he's the problem, it, it just stinks to me of a move that a coach makes when he's trying to get fired. And maybe, maybe that's jumping the gun. Maybe he's not trying to get fired. Maybe you might want to look at reviewing this. And I understand that, like, when the Elks fired everybody, they hired Chris Jones first. Before they even hired their new team president, they hired Chris Jones first to be the head coach and the GM. I get that. So I understand that there's almost certainly a power struggle within that organization. But my God. What did Taylor Cornelius, like, the same week that you got in front of the media, Chris Jones, and said, well, you know, it's our responsibility as the coaches to make sure that Taylor has the confidence that he needs to play. How does benching him after he goes 14 of 18 with a touchdown, how is that building Taylor Cornelius' confidence? What's, how do you reckon, I wish I was a member of the media. I wish I was a member of the media sitting in a presser with Chris Jones so I could just raise my hand and just very simply, like, how do you reconcile those two things? Not to mention, you bench him for a guy that comes off the bench, the very first play that he makes, he fumbles on a standard run pass option play, and then you bench him for the third guy. He's pissed off. You've cut him. Kai Loxley, in case you missed this news this piece of tidbit news they cut they're gonna cut kai loxley because of how he responded on the sidelines and quite frankly you're a professional athlete you shouldn't be standing there with boo boo job face because you fumbled on an rpo and then you got put on the bench you had one play and that's what happened so like don't be mad at anybody but yourself for the fact that you got benched but beyond that how is any of this Good for your quarterback room. The guy I kind of feel bad for is Jared Daig, who looks like he's going to be the starting quarterback this week for the Elks. If he is the starting quarterback moving forward, look, he came into the game, he throws a good ball, 
He very clearly has chemistry with Stephen Dunbar, which is very important for the upside of this Elks offense. So he's got that chemistry there. Let's see how it goes. That team is a mess, man. And this week, that messy Elks team will travel to Ottawa to take on a Red Blacks team that's not really in much of a better place, if we're being perfectly honest. Uh, Red Blacks come into this game off the bye, which is always a good thing for them. Uh, after a two-possession loss to Calgary in Week 2, where Nick Arbuckle gets benched shortly after throwing his fourth interception already of this season. And he gets benched for this week's announced starter, Tyree Adams, who will get the start at quarterback for the Red Blacks. Jeremiah Masoli not ready to go yet. It'll be Tyree Adams this week. And in that game, Ottawa's quarterbacks combined to go 21 of 38 for only 238 yards passing, no touchdowns, two picks, 19 yards on four carries. It's bad news under center. And it's kind of a shame because I feel like this Red Blacks team would be more competitive based on some good things that I've seen them do on the defensive side. Their run defense is fairly good. It's fifth best in the CFL, only giving up 86 and a half rush yards per game so far. They're the top half of the league in sacks. They've got either eight or nine quarterback sacks. I believe it's nine. And they're only allowing 22 and a half points a game on average. So look, it's not all bad for this Red Blacks team, but... The quarterback play has been scary bad, and the secondary has been scary bad, allowing a league-worst 296.5 passing yards per game. So if there's any opponent in the league where your quarterback situation might have a get-right spot, it's probably going to be against the Red Blacks. We got the battle of two basic unknowns here at quarterback, Daig and Tyree Adams. Uh, although, who knows, Trey Ford may also factor into this game if he's ready to go. Maybe he sees some snaps as well. It's tough not to lean on the team who knows who their starting quarterback is and why that's the case. That's the Red Blacks. They know Everybody knows why Tyree Adams is a starting quarterback. Because Nick Arbuckle's thrown four interceptions in like a game and a half. So, everybody knows why Tyree Adams is getting the start this week. I still don't think a lot of people understand the decision, if that is the case, to not start Taylor Cornelius this week. Like, fans are mad at him, and I get it, because fans want success. But, I mean, he's not the problem. He hasn't been the problem. They're not letting him run. He's got, like, he's just, they're not letting a running quarterback run the ball, which is weird. Here's why I'm not, and here's why, yes, I'm holding my nose, and I'm taking the Edmonton Elks to win this game outright in Ottawa. Yes, the Red Blacks are coming off the bye. Yes, you can argue that top to bottom, they've probably been a slightly more successful team this year. They're favored by three and a half points. I'm not buying that extra half point on the second worst team in the CFL, probably. Not even against the worst team in the CFL, probably. And if I'm not going to lay minus three and a half on Ottawa, I probably have more incentive, certainly from a gambling perspective, to just take the Elks money line and kind of hope for the best. That's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to take this from the gambler's perspective. And, um, boy... It's tough, because both of these teams are bad, man. They're, both of these teams are not good. Let's take the Edmonton Elks on the road in Ottawa. It's not a game in Edmonton, so they have a better chance of winning it, apparently. Let's take Edmonton on the road in Ottawa to get the win over the Red Blacks. Jeremiah Masoli cannot get healthy fast enough. So, since I'm taking the Elks to win, obviously I'm grabbing the plus three and a half on the Edmonton Elks in Ottawa, because again... Even if I was going to take Ottawa to win, I have to lay the points because that is a terrible hedge of only three and a half. That margin is so thin. So, yeah, we'll take the Elks to win, and we'll take the Elks with the points. Total in the game set at 42 and a half. Oh, God. Neither one of these teams can score. Like Neither one of these teams put points on the board. But 42 and a half is such a beatable number. 23-20 Edmonton. We'll take the over by the slightest of margins, 43 points on a 42 and a half. We'll take the over. We'll take the plus three and a half on Edmonton and Elks win the game outright because why not? 
Let's go to Montreal now. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers in Montreal to take on the Alouettes. The Bombers suffering their worst loss last week against BC. Their worst loss since all the way back in week 7 of 2015. That was a 30-point loss that they suffered. And that was the season that Winnipeg only won five games. They were bad that year. I think he gave up 500-some points. Definitely a far cry from the Winnipeg Blue Bombers that we know today. But this was their worst loss since all the way back in that, you know, ill-begotten season of 2015. Almost nothing went their way. In almost any measurable aspect of this game, the Bombers were the second best team on the field. And that does not happen very often, especially in Winnipeg. Two key reasons that I'm going to point out for that. Look, it takes nothing away from the BC Lions. They're a great football team. I've been singing their praises now for the better part of two years. They are a great football team top to bottom. But two big reasons I want to point out here. Number one, Zach Kalaros was absolutely hammered behind the line of scrimmage. The Bombers allowing him to get sacked, I think, seven times in that game. So he was under pressure all day long. They also took ten penalties. And it was literally the same week that I talked about how they're not a team that beat themselves. They're not a team that tends to make those kinds of mistakes. They just happened to in this game, and it was a perfect storm. They couldn't protect their quarterback. They took bad penalties. They beat themselves in uncharacteristic ways. On Montreal's sidelines, the Alouettes clobbered the hapless Hamilton Ticats by 26 points, consistently scoring across all four quarters and riding the hot hand of Cody Fajardo. He's had a pretty good start to his Alouettes tenure at quarterback. Uh, Fajardo went 19 of 25 in this game, 292 yards passing, two passing touchdowns, no picks. He protected the ball very well. He added a rush touchdown and 11 yards on four carries. Look, Three total touchdowns for Fajardo, did it with his legs, did it with his arm. He's had a very good start to his career here in Montreal. Also, the second consecutive big game for Austin Mack. Of course, uh, two weeks ago, he went for 120 yards on just four catches. This week, he scores his first two CFL touchdowns. And Kion Julian Grant, another guy that I talked about a couple times last year, called him out specifically for doing some good things. And like, this kid might have a future. He led the way for the Owls, receiving 94 receiving yards on six catches. So again, the big names might not be there anymore. The Geno Lewis's, the Jake Winnickies, the big... Big names might not be there, but the players that are there are finding roles for themselves. Cody Fajardo's throwing the ball very well. This Alouette's offense is no joke. You can't take them lightly. The one area that I think is a major concern, though, for the Alouettes, and it could be their Achilles heel here moving forward, they allow four more sacks on Cody Fajardo. I believe in their two games they've allowed... 10, 9 or 10, it's up there. It's, it's one of the worst marks in the entire league. Yeah, they've allowed 10 in just their two games. And you can't allow your quarterback to take five sacks a game, especially against the really good teams in this league, and expect to find success. And if they're looking for success in this game, that can't happen. Listen, this is a steep climb in competition for the Montreal Alouettes, who have looked like legitimate threats, but against the likes of Ottawa and Hamilton who Ottawa's not a good team, and Hamilton I thought was going to be a great team and have played terribly so far. Now they get a Bombers team who have wounded pride because they just got their lunch served to them last week on their home field. So nobody on that roster is going to be happy. And I somehow get the feeling that maybe they're going to take out that uh, lack of happiness on the Montreal Alouettes. So... Um, LLZ Montreal, best of luck. Um, I'm definitely on the Winnipeg Blue Bombers here in a big bad way to get back on track on the road in Montreal. Let's take the Bombers to get the win over the Alouettes. Now on the line, this uh, line opened at Montreal plus five. It is currently at plus five and a half. I would expect this line to be closer to a touchdown probably by kickoff. A lot of money I think is going to come in on the Bombers favorite at less than a touchdown. While it is at minus five and a half, I am going to go ahead and grab that. I think this could easily be a double digit victory for the Bombers. So minus five and a half, I got no problem with that. I'm going to lay the five and a half points on Winnipeg. Total in the game set at 48 and a half. 
bombers over man that like just because bc shut this offense down doesn't mean this offense is not incredible and the scoring defense for the bombers has not been good this year so i expect the alouettes are going to get their points as well i could easily see this game in the 60s so 48 and a half no problem there at all we're going to go over on that one easily over 48 and a half points in uh winnipeg montreal sorry stumble in winnipeg montreal we are looking at a final score here of 38 to 28 in favor of the winnipeg blue bombers bombers win bombers cover and give me the over and before we head into our final game of the week, I will take the opportunity, as I always do, to shout out my great friends and sponsors at Nerd Tees. NerdTees.ca is where you need to go to find dozens and dozens of incredible loose leaf tea and estate and flavored coffee blends as well. Nerd Tees and Coffee Bean, but you want to go to NerdTees.ca. And you want to use my promo code, which is BWFINEST. That's going to save you 15% at checkout. You're going to get free shipping in Canada on any order over 100 bucks, which is an excellent value. And you're going to grab yourself an incredible blend like today's blend, which is Fruit Roll. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, a fruit roll-up in a cup of tea. Wonders never cease. Fruit Roll is a brand new blend for me and is one of just dozens and dozens of brand new ones, stuff that I've never even tried. And I've been a long time shopper with these folks. Nerdtees.ca is where you need to go. Use my promo code BWFINEST, save you 15%, get your free shipping, get your great conversion rate on the US dollar if you're one of my US viewers. Find yourself something to love or find someone you love something to love. You can do it on Nerdtees.ca. All right, on to the main event of the week, the BC Lions traveling to Toronto to take on the Argonauts. And BC is officially for real. They go out and do that to the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, 30-6. to six. Look, BC entered that game averaging, uh, giving up 7.5 points per game on the defensive side. Their average went down. <laughs> against the best team in the league this defense is a juggernaut for the bc lions and the offense even without dominique grimes they were without their best offensive player the offense is as good as the defense is it's incredible to watch a dominant showing in winnipeg which simply does not happen Big play VA was exactly that in that game last week. 267 all-purpose yards, two passing touchdowns. Alec, uh, Alex, sorry, Alexander Hollins filling in very admirably for Dominique Rimes, catching eight balls for 83 yards and a receiving touchdown. The Lions defense generated seven quarterback sacks, as I mentioned, on Zach Kalaros and an interception. And again, Kalaros doesn't throw a lot of interceptions, but that incredibly good secondary that I've been talking about for two years got one on him in this game. They also allowed just 295 yards of offense to the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. That's a pretty nasty defensive performance. Top to bottom, this BC Lions team is clicking on all counts. I'm not going to say this is why they're as good as they are. There's a laundry list of reasons why the Lions are as good as they are. But if you look at that, what I think is not an overrated stat, that time of possession stat, what does it say? The Lions lead the league in time of possession at 33.46 per game. And they lead by a lot. So I'm not saying it's why they're as good as they are, but it certainly helps. On the other side here, the Toronto Argos, who cruised in the second half, aside from garbage time where they gave up a couple of touchdowns, one of them was fluky, but look, they cruised in this game. They scored 25 unanswered points against the Elks en route to a 2-0 start, and like I mentioned off the top, AJ will let a hat trick of rushing touchdowns. That dude is for real. He's one of my favorite personalities in the CFL. Awesome to see him do that. The Argos won this game because they dominated at the line of scrimmage on all sides. The offense ran for 194 yards rushing on 37 carries. That's not just a commitment to the run. That's pathological. That's like we're going to run the football down your throat for most of this game because you can't stop us. And that's exactly what the case was. 37 carries, 194 yards. The D-line held the Elks run game to just 51 yards on 14 carries. Now, of course, when they went down big, you're not going to run the ball very much anymore or at all. 
But the Argos also generated six quarterback sacks through their pass rush from five different pass rushers and dominated time of possession. Again, 33-37. And you think of how much they scored in that game, but they still possessed the ball way more than the other team. So it's, it's, it's a testament to how good that run game was against Edmonton. Again, as I mentioned, this is easily the game of the week as far as I'm concerned. And it's interesting for the Lions because they go from the team with something to prove, because that's very firmly what they were last week. They go from the team with something to prove to the team that other teams try to prove something against. And they did that in the span of one week. And that's also a testament to the influence of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, because if you can beat the Bombers like that, you immediately become that team on that tier on that level. And it's a major competition jump for the Argos, based on even even if you go back to the preseason, the Argos have played, what was it? It's Hamilton twice, uh, Ottawa, and Edmonton, I believe. So... The competition jump here, I think, is going to be massive, and I think it's going to be too much for them. I'm on the BC Lions in this game. I'm on all three of the road teams. Yes, the Lions are on back-to-back -back road games, but this team is legit. This team is for real, and I think Chad Kelly is going to find throwing the ball much more difficult on this secondary than he did last week against Edmonton. So, going to take the Lions here to get the win. BC beats Toronto. On the line, the Argos are one-point dogs here at home against BC. Such a thin margin. Obviously, I like BC to win. I'm going to lay the single point here on the Lions, minus one. Total in the game at 46.5. This has dropped from a 47 when the line opened. So this line is crawling down just a little bit. The money's pulling it down. I'm still going to take the under here. I think this is a pretty good number. I think this is like within a field goal or so either way. I'm going to stick under on it because, again, how do you not take an under on a Lions defense that's allowing seven points a game? It's crazy. It's it's unbelievable how good they've been this year. We're going to grab the under here, under 46.5 points in BC Toronto. Let's go Lions 26, Argos 17. Going to be a competitive game, a fun game. I like BC. Give me them on the money line. Give me BC minus one and give me the under on the points. There you go, folks. Those are your picks for week four in the CFL. We'll go over them here with you one more time. I've got the Edmonton Elks upsetting the Ottawa Red Blacks 23 to 20 in Ottawa, taking Edmonton straight up. Edmonton plus the three and a half points and the over on the 42 and a half, just barely. I've got the Winnipeg Blue Bombers beating the Montreal Alouettes 38 to 28 in Montreal. Uh, taking the Bombers straight up, taking the Bombers on the line at minus five and a half, and the over on the 48 and a half point total. And I got the BC Lions in Toronto beating the Argos by a score of 26 to 17. Lions straight up, Lions minus one against the spread, and give me the under on the 46 and a half point total. So once again, Genius Sports is not giving me the opportunity to build my fantasy roster yet, but here are some players that I'm targeting. Uh, obviously, going to target Zach Kalaros there. I expect Winnipeg to be the highest scoring team of the week, so Zach Kalaros would be a great option at quarterback, even at max money. Uh, Vernon Adams might be another option there. I expect him to have a pretty similar stat line to what he had against Winnipeg this week. I may even take a flyer on Jared Daig, um, just because he's going to be very, very, very inexpensive, and that's going to give me more money to fill out the rest of my roster, and where there's only three games this week, that's going to be a possibility for me, I'm not going to lie. Running back is going to be tough this week. Uh, AJ Ouellette is the number one scoring running back in fantasy right now, so he's a slam dunk that he's going to go into my roster. We'll see how much his price tag has climbed after a three-touchdown performance. The second one is an absolute coin flip. The teams that are playing this week, are all basically all of them are good against the run. They're like the top teams in the league against the run. So the second running back, I don't think it's worthwhile to spend a lot of money at the running back position this week. I really don't. Uh, my top wide receiver is definitely going to be one that I'm going to stack with my quarterback. So we could see like a Nick Dembski. We could see Dominique Grimes if he's back in. Alexander Hollins. Uh, maybe Geno Lewis or Steven Dunbar if I do decide to go Jared Daig uh, at quarterback. Austin Mack is going to be in my fantasy roster until he gives me a reason not to. 
I'm definitely going to be targeting like a Drew Wallatarski or Kion Julian Grant or maybe even Quan Bray, depending on the price tags. These are guys that have had good average performances so far. Somebody who could very easily give me a 10 spot at some point in fantasy. Hopefully it would come this week. And I'm going to be cheaping out on the defensive side. I'm going to be perfectly honest. Whoever's the least expensive defense, that's probably who I'm going to wind up grabbing. So once again, my finalized fantasy roster will be in the comment section. It'll be the top pinned comment once I can put it together. That's it, folks. The week four episode for the CFL is now in the books. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch and listen. That's it for me, Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled as always by the incredible folks at Nerd Tees. I've got a little extra content coming out in the next uh, couple of weeks. Obviously, we have the third and final video of the 2023 Justin and Tyler Mid-Year Movie Awards. That's going to come out this week. Next week, of course, in addition to CFL Week 5, we're also going to have some bonus CFL content that's a bit of a mystery. I'm keeping it close to the chest, but you'll see that in the next couple of weeks. Thank you so much for watching and listening. We will see you again for Week 5. And we're manifesting a little destiny here. 6-3 and three or better, just saying. 6-3 and three at least or better. Let's see it.